The topic of this session are startups, a special way of doing business. So Kalle, Kalle Airo, has built many organizations, amongst others the Alto Ventures program, which is an entrepreneurship education program at Alt University. And he has dedicated his life to learning in innovation and entrepreneurship and has also had some early startup adventures. So Kale, why is entrepreneurship so important to you? So actually it's, it's, not. it's not. So uh, entrepreneurship is a tool to get some things done. And in the best case, it's a tool to make a better world. So the entrepreneur builds something that makes the world a better place, kind of grows the common good and takes a fair share of that good that is built for the society. Can you explain us what a startup is? So this is a bit complicated thing. So first of all, most startups are not companies and most companies are not startups. And when you confuse these things together, it tends to make understanding the world a bit hard. So st all startups are searching. So they are searching for a repeatable and scalable business model. And because of this, they are temporary organizations. And if we start from the kind of basic definitions, oftentimes people like Steve Blanks and Eric Ries and these guys' definitions, and all of these are about the temporary organization. And then there's like, uh, also a re really nice way of putting this is that startups are an act of rebellion. So you're rebelling against the current stages of the world. You want to make it better and you start a startup for this. But none of these definitions actually require starting a company. It's just a group of people who are searching for a scalable and repeatable business model. So the startup is a, a group of people that has an idea that, that wants to change something. Yes. So that would be what a startup is. Then there's a subgroup of these companies that actually is a company, so startup company. And when investors talk about startups, they typically mean this. And uh, then, then the important thing is growth. So the startup actually wants to grow. And most of the things that are kind of important for startup are actually side product of searching for the scalable business model and growth. And there's a really nice kind of three-point definition by Dave McClure, who's a well-known investor, who says that the startup is a company who is confused about who its customers are, what the products are, and what the business model is. And when it actually finds out all of, all of these three things, it ceases to be a startup company and it becomes a real company. Also, uh, there's the search part for startups, and then there's execution the companies do. So most companies are executing a known business model. And that is like based on Dave McClure's uh, kind of definition of a startup. That's actually when you cease to be a startup company, when you know what you are executing. And this is the thing that most business schools, for example, are really good in teaching. And this is why MBA is a master of business administration. So you administer the business model that you already know. Okay. So is it so that then the startup stops to be a startup at the moment when there will be a company? Not necessarily so. So uh, there's an overlap between the startup and the company and the transition is kind of hard and it's uh, fuzzy where the line actually is. But typically you need to have a company to actually receive investments, for example. And it's a good idea to have a company when you receive money from customers, from investors, or you pay money out of the company. And also you need a company to have some property. You can own typically intellectual property. You start to do something as a company, so then it makes sense to have the legal entity. But it's also you should start the company as late as possible, but not too late. So what is the typical journey of a startup? So where do they come from? So if we talk about the journey first, so typically a startup needs to find a kind of problem solution fit. So they understand a need or problem and they, then they can actually find a solution that makes sense for the users, typically also hopefully customers. But this point when you already have a product and you have a market that are fit to each other, then you can start to have customers and hopefully you can prove that you have many, many customers or the space for the company actually to grow. 
And after the, this, that rarely happens, you can start to actually look the, for the go-to-market plans, go-to-market strategies for the company. So this is the kind of typical journey. But there are basically four stories how this begins. So sometimes there, there's a group of people who want to start a company. And then there's a, uh, means that there's a team first, then there's an idea. They come up with an idea, they hopefully validate that with the real customers. Then this can also happen the other way around, that there's an idea first, typically with one person, who then builds a team to actually execute this idea. And these are the most typical startups. And then there are two other kind of typical ways of starting this, but they are mostly for spin-off companies. So in a university, you might have a research team who wants to start something together. And this is then basically the first story. But oftentimes it happens so that they do research, and based on that research, they find out, hey, this is a team that I want to do something with. And then they kind of find the idea later on. And then this is the same story about testing with the customers and finding the problem solution fit. But it varies in the universities whether it's so that you actually have the need first, then you do research on that and build a team, or is the research team that does it the other way around. So what it is ultimately about is that you have an idea and you ask whether or not there's a market for this idea so these are the two elements, and then you start um, to continue. Yes, so, and you actually test. So asking necessarily isn't the way, but you test this. And the reason why you typically need a team is that for actually finding that idea that works, you need to have deep, typically implicit understanding of the needs and problems. And on the other hand, you need to have the deep understanding of potential solutions. And then these th things click inside the mind of an individual or inside a team. And after the fact, these things typically are self-evident. But uh, how these people typically work is they do basically social science research on the needs, and they have their expertise on the potential solutions. And out of that kind of deep knowledge, there is this idea that is self-evidently good for the customers, and they want to keep your prototypes, or they want to give you money for actually keeping your prototypes. So when should one think of having a company? Then? So the most simple kind of acid test for this is that do you need to move money? So if somebody gives you money or you give as in pay money out of out of your startup, then you need to have a legal entity and typically it makes sense to have a company. And because you typically have a team, then it typically is a limited liability company. And the other kind of easy test is that do you need to own something as the, as the company? So if you build, let's say, software, somebody needs to have the copyright and intellectual property rights for that that software, and then you need a legal entity who, who owns that. So that, Because if I, as a co-founder, code something, I own it. And the other founders have no rights to this. And if we want to have a startup company who typically needs financing, then that company needs to own, first of all, the company needs to exist in order to receive the uh, investments, but it also needs to own the intellectual property that's selling or using. So, yeah, so you have three points, more or less, than... Uh uh, that you need f when you need when you have the money that moves then when you uh, to, to limit the liability probably and then also to structure the ownership of the between the between the shareholders how important is it to know who knows who owns what for example if the three of us would start a software company and i would develop the software the company would not automatically own this and it's really important point that the company needs to have ownership of what it sells. And in this specific case, I could just walk away and the company would have nothing if I would own the software and uh, the company would not. So you first are a startup and then you grow into a company. But what then? So typically that doesn't happen. So most startups don't make sense as a company. So they just, if there's no legal entity, they just enter projects and that it. That's it, or then they might run down the company in kind of an organized way. But if you are one of those lucky companies who actually find the product market fit and, and are able to grow, that's the point when you typically want to take in investments from business angels or venture capitalists. And when you take this kind of investment, you also decide that you are going to sell the company. You have now committed to selling the company. And that means that the likelihood of being a huge success grows, and the likelihood of going bankrupt grows highly. 
because especially venture capitalists are not interested in just okay outcomes. And uh, typically also the stress level of the founders grows. If you have these venture capitalists investing in a company, so then you need to look for these cases where one of the founders wants to leave, or in some cases the other founders and investors want basically to kick somebody out of the, out of the company. How much startup is there in the company still? I mean, isn't the company all the time evolving and isn't that a similar process to founding a startup? So for a kind of a startup as a start, it's an experiment. So yes, large companies typically do these kind of uh, units or they spin out small startups that or small spin off companies that behave like startup companies. But oftentimes in larger companies, you have incentives to keep the cash flow going and keep on doing business as usual. So even though they want to behave like startups, it rarely happens in a large company. But there's, there are these specific cases like Volt or Facebook who are growing like a startup, even though they are already worth billions, but they want to be worth several billions really quickly with high risk level. So, Kalle, you said that uh, startups typically look for scalability. If I want to have a scalable startup, what do I need to do? What do I need to check? So, first of all, we haven't actually discussed about what does scalable mean. Exactly. So, in simple terms, it means that your revenue or money coming in grows faster than your cost, as in money going out grows. So, the more you sell, the more you make profit. But the way how you ensure that this happens is actually that you start from really small. So you need to have at least one customer and one user for your product or service who would do this for free. Then you need to prove that somebody is actually willing to pay, might be that user or might be somebody else who is paying to you. And after that, you are interested in how many of these customers can you actually have so that you could prove that there is actually space for growing that company and kind of actually scaling it up. Many many startup entrepreneurs have the, it's it's a it's it's a life uh, for them. So so it appears to be. So what 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 role does the company have in the life of a founder or entrepreneur? So that of course varies based on the individuals, but I think that in the best case, the company is a tool for the entrepreneur to do something, typically build value to somebody, and then earn some money while doing so. But it's hard to say for an individual what the role should exactly be. But the important thing is that you decouple the entrepreneur or the founding team and the company so that these are different, different entities. And oftentimes the really successful entrepreneurs are serial entrepreneurs, meaning that they have several companies. When they end one, they start a new one. Or portfolio entrepreneurs who own several companies And maybe the typical kind of startup portfolio entrepreneur would start one company that becomes successful uh, and would keep on owning that, have a board membership in that company, and then start a new company, uh, maybe as the CEO or CTO of that company, and end up with a portfolio of several companies. And this isn't as foreign as it sounds like Elon Musk has several companies. If you think of many of these people who own hugely successful technology companies, they actually are the founders and the entrepreneurs in several companies. So they are all the time looking for new ideas, basically. Ideas, yes, uh, ideas, opportunities, these kind of things. Also, you know, oftentimes these really successful billionaires would be looking for a way to leave a legacy. So that's why the founders uh, uh, of many companies want to do satellite or kind of rocket ship companies, bring people to Mars. So we were speaking about the idea and the need for there to be a market and then there's a need for getting investors and and so the idea is 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 already much but of course there needs to be more there needs to be input there needs to be a market and and so um how how to test this i mean is it so easy that you just ask someone hey do you want to be a test customer or i think it depends on the product uh, it, it is not everything It's not not every idea is so easy to test. Um, what do you think when you speak with with friends or or relatives about your idea? Do you think that you can get feedback from there? So I would typically advise not to go there for feedback. And 
it kind of depends. An entrepreneur has two products. So the product that the company is selling and the company itself. And typically, friends, fools, and family are the first investors into your company. So if you need money, you might want to ask these friends, fools, and family if they are kind of bold enough to back up your business. But typically, they back up you and not the idea. So getting money from these people doesn't actually prove that much. But the other thing is that if you ask them, would they test your prototype? If they don't take it for free, that's a really bad idea. So you know already, if people are not willing to use your product even for free, that's a problem. Uh, but if they take that for free and want to keep it, that's a positive sign. If they are willing to pay money for getting your prototype or get, uh, actually you giving it to them so that they don't need to give it back to you. All of these are really positive signs, but typically you are interested in people's behavior more more than what they actually say. So, uh, of course, we all know these success stories. Um, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, they have founded companies, they became very rich, and, and this is kind of what, what maybe many entrepreneurs dream about. But then um, one has to be realistic, and, and it is often so that um, the attempt fails. So you, you have an idea from which you think that it can um, have a market which can satisfy a need of a customer, but it doesn't happen. So you, you fail. What does failure mean for an entrepreneur? And what can you learn out of the failure? So failure means experience. That would be the positive side of it. And oftentimes, uh, other entrepreneurs and investors would actually believe you more if you have failed and you have reflected why you failed and you have learned. And you have good, then kind of better starting point for your next adventures. Of course, in, in the kind of current way of doing startups, you set up your company to do kind of uh, several experiments. So those experiments fail and not the company as a whole. But yes, oftentimes few first companies of successful entrepreneurs actually were not only not successful, but horrible failures. And it used to be in the US that this would be the mindset that you have failed several times, so now you will be more successful for the next time. And then in the kind of, uh, let's say, the Protestant ethic of Baltic Sea region and North, Northern and kind of Northern Central Europe would have been that you fail once, so you are a failure. But that luckily has been changing, uh, let, let's say, in two last decades. So a failure is something you, you gain as a person, you learn out of the failure, even though it is, of course, not nice. You wished to get more, but, but this is, um, you grow as an entrepreneur out of the failure. Yes, but that's also why startups are not companies. So if you fail really fast, you, you have a group of two or three people who are working on a business idea, and the business idea isn't good. You know that this cannot be done or should not be done as a business then that doesn't even count as a failure. But if you start the company and the company fails, even goes bankrupt, then you still learn, but you need to be able to kind of tell other people a convincing story that what you learned out of that failure. Which also requires that you have to be, as, as an entrepreneur, you have to be strong enough to kind of get your hands of an idea which you have worked with for years and which you have had in your mind once you see that nothing gets out of that. Yes, and that is why you need to separate yourself from the idea, you need to separate yourself from the company and understand that all of these three things are different. Mm -hmm. Idea failing doesn't mean that the company fails and company failing doesn't mean that the entrepreneur would fail. So, so Galia told us about failures. Uh, there can be also risks in a company, so you can have some some kind of risks. And in when when starting a business, uh, so how can you manage this risk? So the most magical tool for this is the limited liability company, and it's one of the best inventions in the Western civilization of all the, all of the times. And the point there is that you put in equity, so you buy shares from the company, and you only risk that money. So if the company goes bankrupt, the investors only lose that money that they have invested in the company. And that's mentally, that's really hard for an entrepreneur to stay on that level, so that you do not guarantee the loans of the company or anything like that. But an entrepreneur sets the worst case scenario. 
you only should invest that much money and that much time to your company that you are willing to lose. And for our students, the really simple example would be not even a company, but a startup. So you have three months of uh, summer holiday, you have 5,000 euros of money that you have saved from your previous summer jobs, and you decide that I'm going to put three months of my life and 5,000 euros for this company. And after three months, you decide that, hey, this is not a good comp- a good idea to continue, and you lost the three months, and you lost some of that 5,000, not necessarily even all of that 5,000 euros. So so limited liability companies here are, uh, as you said, they limit your liability. <laughs> so so you don't ha- you only have to, to lose the money that you have invested, unless you have personally guaranteed that that's what you shouldn't do, maybe. Uh, but but what else do you gain from limited liability companies? What's what's the so what is it a tool for? Because you only lose the equity invested, you can pull equity from several people or several investment companies. So you get more resources more easily and you can also distribute your risk. So like the portfolio entrepreneurs might have their their kind of ownership share in different companies. If we would start, let's say, three companies, we could choose that we own one third of each of the companies, even though we are not part of the management of the company. And we would have a portfolio of companies that would be kind of same risk level, same reward expectation level for the company. But for each of us, the the reward level that we are expecting would be the same, but the risk level would be one third of what it would be for an individual company. And uh, the limited liability company also makes possible not only to pool the financial resources, but also other kind of resources, hiring people that are not working directly for you and taking bigger risks as that company than what you could take as an individual. Thank you, Kali. So what do you think, what are the key takeaways from this? For an entrepreneur, it's important to understand that startups and companies are separate, but partially overlapping tools in the toolkit. And you should think which tool you use at which point. So typically you have the startup that's not a company in the beginning, And then you start the company when you need that for something and use that company as a tool to achieve your goals. And remember that the startup is not you, the company is not you as an individual, but both of these are tools to achieve something that you want to achieve in your life. Thank you very much. For Thank coming. you. Thank you.